Hello, uh, thank you for watching this talk. Uh, today I'll be talking about peer with default and applications. And this is worked together with my co-authors uh, for Google and Nichu, who is our intern and is currently at Arizona State University. Uh, first, let me discuss what's the problem we're trying to solve. The particular problem we're looking at is called inner join, private join, and compute. So in this problem, consider a user who has several IDs, X1 through XM, and several associated weights, V1 through VM, associated with each ID. And also a server who has a much larger database of a similar kind with many more IDs Y and associated with uh, W. And the goal is for the user to find the inner product of uh, its data set with the server's data set only for those values Xi, which are in the set Y contained or held by the server. And for all such values, it should learn the product of the sum of the products Vx times Wx, where Vx represents the value associated with that for each particular x, and W represents the value W associated with uh, that particular y. So the server should learn this, uh, the user should learn this inner product together with some differentially private noise added epsilon. And in particular, nothing more should be learned by the user nor should anything extra be learned by the server. Uh, so as we noted, the functionality we want is a user should learn the dark product of weights, perhaps with noise added, for IDs in the intersection of X and Y. And furthermore, we want the user's communication and computation costs to be nearly linear in the size of its own data set. Um, in particular, it should grow very slowly with the server's data set size, and that's what this tilde means. And the assumption is that the user set is much smaller than the server's data set. In terms of privacy, what we want is that each party's input should remain hidden. We also want that the elements of X intersection Y should remain hidden, and this is which IDs were in common. We may further want that the size of the intersection should remain hidden, which is the number of IDs that were in common. But we assume that the sizes of the inputs, size of X and size of Y, are OK to reveal to each of the parties. Um, and this leakage can be mitigated by padding the inputs on either side with random IDs. So why do we care about this problem? Let's look at a couple of hypothetical applications. So the first. Uh, application we could think of is for exposure notification, where the data held by the user could be thought of as the Bluetooth IDs of devices the user has been in proximity with. And the values associated with each ID could be how close the user was to that uh, other Bluetooth ID, uh, for example, and how long they may have spent in proximity. And on the server side, you could think of the server as holding a data set of all the users who reported being uh, infected with a particular disease, say COVID-19. And the weight could represent the uh, you know, virulence of that user on a particular day. Um, so for example, there could be one row for each user day here. Um, and so the output of an inner join, private join compute in this setting would be uh, for those users who the user was, for those IDs who the user was in uh, close contact with, it read the product of the proximity weight and the virulence weight, which could give, in some sense, how likely the user was to be infected, and uh, potentially with some noise added. So this, you could use this kind of inner joint PJ and C in order to um, to achieve an exposure notification to do this kind of exposure notification computation. And obviously, privacy is important here. Um, basically, you could show an alert if the uh, value here is above some threshold, for example. Another potential application is to measure ad effectiveness. So on one hand, you could have the user being a merchant with a bunch of IDs corresponding to users who bought some particular type of item, and the values being the spend values. And on the server side, you could have a server holding a whole bunch of user IDs corresponding to users who've seen 
an ad for a particular uh, campaign, uh, let's say a shoe ad. And the weight could correspond to the time decayed effect of that ad. So this is assuming that both the merchant and the ad tech company have fixed a particular date on which they want to do a measurement. And the merchant is only using transactions for that particular date. And so what you could want to uh, compute is the weighted conversion credit that should be given to the ad tech company for showing ads to these users, where conversion is basically somebody seeing an ad and then going and buying that thing. So in this case, the uh, this weighted conversion credit, you could uh, do uh, compute it, for example, by taking the spend value and multiplying it by a time decayed ad effect for a particular user who both saw an ad and bought something. So in this case, the inner join, private join, and compute could basically com uh, compute like the total uh, value uh, spent by users um, who had also seen ads and proportionally decayed based on how long it had been uh, since that user had seen an ad. So clearly, privacy is important here, and would be uh, you know neither party would want to reveal to each other, but might be uh, happy revealing the aggregates. So uh, basically, our approach to solving this problem is to build a secure multi-party computation protocol uh, tailored for computing inner join, private join, and compute, and focusing on asymmetric input sizes. So uh, what are the properties we want from this? As we mentioned before, we want to hide the particular items that are in common between the user and the server, hide the size of the intersection, be able to compute the inner product on the associated values in the intersection, and we want the user cost to be uh, nearly linear in only its input size and relatively independent of the server's input size. So the private join and compute protocol, as designed by Google and uh, described in this blog post, achieves the first and third property, but uh, reveals the intersection size and furthermore, the user cost is linear in the size of both it and the service data set. Now, there's another technology known as private information retrieval, which basically is very well tailored to asymmetric data set sizes. And in fact, you can build inner join, private join, compute from private information retrieval, basically by using it as a private set intersection protocol. And so if you do so, you would the basic way you would use private information retrieval to build private set intersection reveals the items, particular items in the intersection, and it reveals the intersection size. But given that it uh, allows computation on the intersection and also um, has user costs that's proportional to only the, that's almost linear in the smaller data set. On the other hand, there's a very nice work uh, uh, based on called circuit PSI, which uses garbled circuits in order to do uh, private set intersection. And in this case, you can get all of the first three properties. That means you can hide the intersection, the size of the intersection, and compute arbitrary functions on the intersection, including dot products. But uh, again, incurs cost linear or like slightly more than linear in both of the two parties as data sets. And so in our work, we get all four of these properties. Um, and basically, our approach is going to be to use uh, some kind of private information retrieval. And uh, I'd just like to note here that our, this setting is actually also addressed by this work uh, by uh, Chen, Huang, uh, Lane, and Rindel, um, which also does a kind of asymmetric private side intersection and allows computing over the intersection. So their work differs from ours in several important ways. And for a more detailed comparison, uh, please do refer to the full version of the paper. So with that, let's jump into how our construction works. So at first, I'll give an overview of the pieces that go into building inner joint private joint and compute. Uh, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to start from a private information retrieval protocol. So in private information retrieval, uh, a user has a particular index i, and a server has a database consisting of many uh, identifiers. And basically what it 
here allows the user to do is to retrieve the ith index value from the server. So the first thing we want to do is actually to use a variant of pair called keyword pair, where the user, instead of having an index, now has a keyword x. And the server has key value pairs, y and w. And keyword pair now allows the user to uh, basically query this keyword and retrieve w of x if x is in y, or otherwise retrieve garbage. So the first thing we're going to do is start with a keyword pair scheme. And the next thing we're going to do is modify this keyword pair scheme so that instead of getting garbage when x is not in y, instead the user will retrieve some prescribed default value from the server without revealing to the server that a default value was received. And note that in normal peer schemes, I didn't say this before, but peer schemes don't reveal to the server what the client was querying. And that's also the case in what we're going to call peer default. Uh, so basically, the client queries on X, and the difference from keyword peer is instead of re receiving garbage when the client doesn't, when X is not in Y, the client will instead receive a server chosen default value. So we're going to build key peer defaults from keyword peer. And in fact, we're going to do something more, which is we're going to allow the client to have a value V. And what's going to happen is the client is either going to retrieve V times W of X in case X is in Y, or otherwise it's going to retrieve the default value T. And we're going to introduce a further modification, which is so that the client doesn't just retrieve these values, but it will receive these mal values masked with a random mask chosen by the server. And once we introduce this random mask, we'll actually gain the property that the client will not be able to tell whether it received uh, V times W or whether it received the default value. And so this is exactly what we're going to call extended period default. So actually what our work does is it uh, gives a construction for extended period default. And once we have this extended period default, we can use this to build inner join, private join, and compute in a straightforward way. So just to pause here, what extended period default is doing is the client has a key value pair, and the server has many key value pairs. And the client is able to retrieve either the mass product of the values, the associated values, if X is in the server's data set, or it will receive a masked default value if X is not in the server's data set. And so what we're going to do to build inner join, private join, and compute from this is now recall the user has many different key value pairs, and so does the server. The user is going to execute extended period default on each of its inputs, xi, vi, with the server using default value 0 and a different random mask each time. So note that in each of these executions, the user will either receive the product of vi times wi, masked with a different mask, or it will receive 0 mask with that same mask. And this will happen for each of its different XIVIs. Then the user will simply sum together all the outputs it's received from each execution to get a value T. And the server will sum together all the masks it used in each of these executions and send these over to the user together with some noise added epsilon. And this noise is going to be for differential privacy. And the user is now going to subtract the sum of the masks that the server provided from the sum of the values it retrieved in step one. And this, it turns out, is exactly going to be the noisy inner product uh, as we needed. And so this is how we would build inner join, private join, compute from extended peer with default. And this is going to be our solution strategy. And so given this, now the question is, how do we build this extended period default? And that's what we'll be going into next. 
So again, our starting point is going to be using a private information retrieval protocol. Uh, and so in most private information retrieval protocols or single server private information retrieval protocols that are efficient, uh, they leverage homomorphic encryption. And so the clients will basically encrypt the index I for which it wants to retrieve something from the server. And technically, you know, it's not exactly encrypting the index I, but it's some special encoding of I, but we skip the details here. And what the server does is it expands this into an, uh, one hot vector of n values, where it, all the encryptions are zero, except in the i position. And this expansion is done homomorphically. Uh, so the server doesn't know which index is zero and which index is one. And then it executes a homomorphic dot product with these ciphertexts with its data set. And sums together the results, which will basically give it an encryption of exactly yi, because all the other values homomorphically multiplied by zero. And this will get sent back to, this, to the client, who can decrypt to get yi. And so what do we do if we have an ID or keyword instead of an index? So there's a couple of different approaches you can go in order to deal with a keyword, but our approach is to use a bloom filter. And what is a bloom filter? Just to give some background, a bloom filter is a data structure which allows to test membership. So suppose a server has a data set which consists of a Y1 to Yn. It can create a bloom filter which consists of bits B1 to B capital N, where capital N is larger than little n. And the client can now uh, take its value X and turn it into K indices, H1X to HKX, which can be computed by simply hashing X using K different hash functions specified by the Bloom filter. And now, the client can test membership in the Bloom filter by looking up the Bloom filter entries at each of the positions HIX. And if all the Bloom filter entries are one, then the client can conclude that its item X is in the set Y, except with some negligible failure probability. So this is a well, there are well-known constructions of Bloom filters uh, and it's a widely used uh, primitive. And uh, just for concreteness, we'll be using 31 hash functions, uh, which will give a failure probability of two to the minus 40. And this will mean that the boom filter has an expansion of 58 times. And so the way we're gonna do keyword pair is to use a regular in key, uh, index pair that as we had uh, discussed earlier, together with boom filters. So recall that we have user and server with key value pairs. Let's just forget about the values for now and have the user just use a single keyword. What we're going to do is have the server create a bloom filter out of its keywords and have the user send k encryptions, one for each entry of the bloom filter that it would need to look up in order to do its uh, membership check. And it can send these as peer queries, so encrypted using a homomorphic encryption scheme. And then the server can process each of these peer queries to basically get encryptions of those particular bits in the Bloom filter uh, corresponding to the indices that the client had sent. And then it can homomorphically sum the responses to get the sum of all those Bloom filter bits and add a random mask R2 and send it to the client. And the client can decrypt and subtract k, where k is a number of hash functions that were in the Bloom filter, and therefore get r1. And we know that r1 is equal to r2 if and only if x is in y. And this is because r1 will be equal to r2 precisely when all the bits b that were retrieved, that would have been retrieved in the peer query were all one or there were k one bits in other words. So this is a way to take index pair and turn it into keyword pair. 
And of course, you just recall that there's some failure probability two to the minus 40 here. And so suppose you have this step now where you have R1 and R2 that are equal if and only if X is in Y. Let's just stash these for a second because we're gonna use them later. And now let's think about what we're gonna do with associated values. And to deal with associated values, we're gonna use something called a garble blue filter. And a garble blue filter is another a data structure is very similar to a blue filter, where now instead of just having keywords, a server can have key value pairs. And the garble bloom filter will now be able to encode these key value pairs such that a client can take its input and query k locations in the bloom in the garble bloom filter such that the result of uh, adding together those k locations in the garble bloom filter will be exactly the associated value if x is in y. However, if X is not in Y, then the garble bloom filter entries will sum to some unknown value, uh, which is undetermined or unspecified by the bloom filter. It could be anything. And so what this next piece of our construction is to be to combine peer with garble bloom filters. And so what the server is gonna do is make a garble bloom filter out of its key value pairs. And now let's just think of the user as having a single key value pair, X and B. And so what the user is gonna do is now send in, again, encryptions of the locations that wants to look up in the bloom filter corresponding to its input X. The server is again going to process these uh, encrypted indices as peer queries, and thereby get encryptions of the locations at the bloom filter that the client wanted and homomorphically sum the responses. And the user is actually also going to send along an encryption of the value V that it had. And the server is going to homomorphically multiply this value V into the sum that it had computed in the previous step. And furthermore, it's going to mask this value with a random mask S2 and send it back to the user who will decrypt to get S1. And note that S1 and S2 are additive secret shares of Vx times Wx if x is in y, and are secret shares of something random or some garbage value, otherwise, some undetermined value. So now from these two things, what we have is if we do the peer query on a bloom filter and the peer query on the garble bloom filter, the user will have retrieved values R1 and S1, and the server will have created values R2 and S2 with the properties that R1 equals R2 if and only if X is in Y, and S1 and S2 are secret shares of V times W if X is in Y, and secret shares of some garbage value otherwise. And now in order to get pure default, what we're gonna do is have the user and the server execute a generic MPC protocol, where this generic MPC protocol will output secret shares T1 plus T2, uh, which will be um, shares of V times W if X is in Y, and shares of zero otherwise. And this is exactly what we wanted for pure with default. And note that this generic MPC protocol now only needs to take as input these values R1, S1, R2, and S2, and does not depend on the size of the service data set. Uh, and in fact, it's easy to modify this to make it so that the server can specify a default value such that instead of the T1 plus T2 adding up to zero, they instead add up to the server specified default value. And this is exactly the crux of our uh, construction. And note that the generic MPC protocol can be any generic MPC protocol, but we specifically use a uh, garbled circuit based protocol. And our construction also has several optimizations. Um, so note that we described everything just for a single key value pair. But in fact, um, 
you can get huge benefits by doing multiple key value pair queries in parallel. And this is a, a well-known uh, technique used in peer and keyword peer, uh, which it uses slotting and batching of homomorphic encryption schemes. And another well-known optimization, which is to cuckoo hash the inputs on the uh, client side, which basically is a standard technique that allows um, grouping the uh, inputs into smaller uh, groups so that the peers are uh, executed over smaller sets. And this basically has the effect of inducing a huge computational savings on the server with some minor increase in the client's uh, costs. Uh, I'll now uh, discuss some of the experimental costs for our implementation of this peer with default. Um, so in these graphs, I'd like to highlight the communication costs. So in particular, the presentation, uh, sorry, the uh, construction we presented is the red line here, uh, marked as construction two. And uh, on the x-axis, you have the database size held by the server. And on the y-axis, you have the log of the communication uh, between the client and the server. Um, and T here is the number of uh, queries the client makes to the server's data set. And basically what this graph shows is that the uh, communication cost grows very slowly as the, grows slowly as the server's data set size increases, which is exactly what we wanted. And in particular, comparing to other works, uh, existing works. Uh, I also just wanted to highlight that there's actually, you know, the construction we presented is actually the second construction in the paper. And there is actually a warm up construction, which we didn't discuss, which is actually also very interesting, which essentially uses a naive peer instead of a peer, like a compressing peer, which is what we've discussed so far. Um, and it's very interesting. And please do take a look. It's in the full version of the paper. Um, Next, uh, we also measured, you know, the end-to-end -end runtime and total communication. And here, I particularly like to highlight uh, this setting, which is where there's a large gap between the server's data set size and the client's data set size. And here, we can see that our communication costs, in particular, are uh, quite a bit smaller than existing works. And this is exactly what we uh, were aiming for. But note that our computation costs are quite a bit higher. And so a natural question is, how would we justify this larger uh, computation cost? Um, well, because of that, we looked at total monetary costs. That is the cost that would be incurred if you ran this uh, protocol over GCP. And in particular, again, looking at this uh, sector where there's a large gap between the client and server communication costs, we can see that specifically for the client, the costs are a lot lower. Uh, than in other works, like other works in, uh, incur equal costs for a client and server. But uh, basically our protocol offloads a lot of the monetary costs to the server. And in fact, if you look at the uh, total costs, our total costs are higher than existing works, but um, moderately higher. Um, so they're still like somewhat competitive, um, but we have the huge benefit that the client does not uh, incur as much cost as a server. Uh, so now I'll briefly discuss ways that our protocol can be extended. Uh, the first is that we can, uh, we so far discussed the inner join functionality between the two just data sets, inner join dot product. But in fact, we can easily support any uh, other function F, which is supported by the homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, underlying the peer with defaults construction that we described. Uh, and furthermore, uh, instead of just doing sums, so here we had the sum of uh, values f of, uh, you know, the two associated values associated with x. But in fact, instead of sums, we could do any uh, computation g over these values, where g is anything supported by a secret sharing scheme. And in particular, you know, uh, over secret shares, you can compute any uh, any function using generic MPC protocol. So in fact, you can do any G if you want to. Um, 
So that's all that I wanted to present and thank you. And please feel free to reach out to me or any of the other co-authors if you have questions. Thank you. Uh, so now I'll briefly discuss ways that our protocol can be extended. Uh, the first is that we can, uh, we so far discussed the inner join functionality between the two data sets, inner join dot product. But in fact, we can easily support any uh, other function f, which is supported by the homomorphic encryption scheme uh, underlying the period defaults construction that we described. Uh, and furthermore, uh, instead of just doing sums, so here we had the sum of uh, values f of uh, you know the two associated values associated with x. But in fact, instead of sums, we could do any uh, computation g over these values, where g is anything supported by a secret sharing scheme. And in particular, you know, uh, over secret shares, you can compute any uh, any function using generic MPC protocol. So in fact, you can do any g if you want to. Um, so that's all that I wanted to present. And thank you. And please feel free to reach out to me or any of the other co-authors if you have questions. Thank you.